the next talk will be about on-device federal training with Flower, uh, and it will be presented by Akil. Akil is a principal research scientist at Nokia Bell Labs in Cambridge, and also a visiting industrial fellow at the University of Cambridge. So, um, okay, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Tenor. Can you guys see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. All right, so I'm gonna to talk today about uh, on-device federated learning with Flower. And uh, sort of looking at the title, it might be slightly confusing because federated learning by definition is supposed to be on-device, right? We want to train on client devices. But uh, it turns out that a lot of the research papers we see today, uh, they are uh, many of them are actually implemented using uh, simulations, using uh, multiple for loops, et cetera. So there is less of uh, practical deployment on the client devices. And in this talk, I really want to argue that uh, it's, it's super important to actually profile and deploy these federated learning algorithms on the actual devices, both from, both from the perspective of a realistic evaluation, but also even to, deploy, to develop new kind of federated, federated training techniques. Uh, so the, if, if you look at like the centralized training uh, uh, paradigm today, uh, we know that there is a, a, a re relative sort of homogeneity in how uh, this kind of training happens. So mostly we have uh, the network that, that is used is a LAN network. Uh, Linux is one of the preferred platforms. You have a few sets of standardized hardware, some frameworks, et cetera. And uh, that makes centralized learning uh, relatively easy from a sort of systems and frameworks perspective. But if you look at the same uh, angle from a federated learning perspective, there is a massive heterogeneity in the sort of client devices on which we will train these models. So we no longer just have LAN-based connections. These clients could be connected over Wi-Fi, over LoRaWAN, 2G, 3G, et cetera, even Bluetooth, low energy, things like that. Uh, we have massive heterogeneity in the platforms uh, on these clients, even the uh, underlying processor that is used to train these models, and even the communication protocols uh, used to exchange the data between the server and the client. And uh, the important thing is that many of these parameters can actually impact the performance of predicted learning algorithms in a profound way. Maybe less so about the accuracy of the algorithm, but more about the convergence time and the energy it takes to run the algorithm, et cetera. And uh, so I will basically present some initial results in this direction and try to make the case that, you know, it's super important to uh, deploy these models on actual client devices and profile their performance to, to sort of develop new kinds of federated learning algorithms. Uh, so we, pro we saw this slide earlier in the, in the summit uh, when Daniel presented his talk uh, about how Flower can federate any existing machine learning project. And the idea there was that, you can take a existing machine learning pipeline and write this lightweight flower client. Uh, and that can basically federate your existing machine learning workloads. So this is, this is really useful and we can potentially use that on edge devices as well. But it also means that we are sort of limited by the current training capabilities of these edge devices. For example, uh, in, in this talk, I will talk, I will mention how we did federated learning with Android based devices. And today, if you look at Android ecosystem, there is no easy way to train full-fledged TensorFlow or PyTorch models. You can potentially you know, compile and deploy your customized libraries, but uh, looking at the standard API, standard libraries, there is no easy way to train uh, full-fledged machine learning models. And uh, so we had to do some modifications to how we train these models, and I will talk about that in the next slide. Uh, so for Android specifically, we actually leverage the TensorFlow Lite model personalization support for doing federated learning. So for those of you who are familiar with TensorFlow Lite, it's primarily used for on-device inference, but they also have this capability to do on-device model personalization. And the way it works is that you take uh, what is called a base model, which is like a pre-trained feature extractor. It could be a ResNet 50, ResNet 18, whatever, trained on, let's say, some... Uh, global data set like ImageNet, et cetera. And you also take a randomly initialized head model. In simpler terms, this head model is just a classifier that we, that we want to train using federated learning. And it could be just, let's say two or three layers of, uh, uh, two or three fully connected layers. We, we implement both this base model and the head model in Python on our, on our BC or our workstation. And then we use this tool provided by Google called uh, TFLi transfer converter 
which essentially compiles and converts this model uh, for on-device personalization for Android. And you, then you, you take this model, package that in your Android application, and then we can train it using local data. And uh, the interesting thing is like this, this existing pipeline uh, was already there. And all we had to do using Flower was to implement this lightweight Flower client, and which, which had like these three methods called fit, evaluate, and get weights. Uh, and these methods basically serve as a bridge between the TensorFlow Lite mod model personalization code and the Flower, uh, Flower client APIs. Uh, again, the Flower client here was implemented in Java to, to be compatible with Android. And the Flower server was actually implemented in Python. And they were both communicating over gRPC using serialized byte buffers. And I, the, the point I want to emphasize here is that even though there is sort of language heterogeneity, one, the server is written in Python, the clients are written in Java, Flower was able to support uh, implementation of these kind of heterogeneous clients as well. Uh, then after we implemented this client, we, uh, wait a second, my slides are stuck. Back. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. After we implement this these clients, we actually deployed them on. Uh, so we deployed the Flower server on an Amazon EC2 machine, and we actually deployed these clients on personal our personal Android devices, as well as on Android devices, uh, smartphones and tablets in the AWS device farm. So for those of you who are not familiar with the AWS device farm, it is uh, basically uh, something provided by Amazon where you can rent Android devices uh, on an hourly basis, maybe pay like 10 cents per hour and you can get a wide variety of Android devices on AWS. And so we could actually rent some of these devices and deploy this federated learning workloads on those devices. And we implemented like several data sets also using on, on the Android with federated learning. And this code right now is in a uh, is in a separate pull request in in the in the flower repo, but it will be soon merged with the main repo in, in the next few days. Uh, the next experiment we did was with uh, embedded devices. In this case, Raspberry Pi and Nvidia Nvidia Jetson family. Uh, the interesting thing here is that both these devices are Python enabled, so in that sense, we can run uh, like full fledged TensorFlow or PyTorch based training pipelines there. So there are no complications like we had in Android. But the challenge here was more from a sort of hardware heterogeneity perspective that Raspberry Pi has a CPU as a processor. These NVIDIA Jetson devices could have embedded GPU as well. And uh, the interesting thing was that we did not have to change the implementation of the Flower client at all. All we did was uh, took the same implementation and then wrapped them inside a Docker container specific to that host. So we basically, uh, took a Docker container for Raspberry Pi, which supports uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow. And similarly for Jetson devices, and we just use the same uh, client code for Flower, and we were able to do this kind of federated training. Uh, and in, in this direction, you can also potentially combine uh, these kind of Python-based clients with Android clients and have like this massively heterogeneous setting for federated training. Uh, what I want to really focus on in the rest of my talk is really talk about like the evaluation and what kind of insights we can get from this real world deployment of these uh, federated learning pipelines. Uh, so one of the important hyperparameters in federated learning today is the number of local epochs for training. Uh, and let's say you, you don't have this kind of realistic deployment and we just are simulating federated learning by using for loops or whatever on our personal machine. And so we can do this experiment, we can vary the local epochs and we get, get like different accuracies for federated training. And just by looking at these numbers, we may feel that, okay, local epoch equal to 10 is probably the best hyperparameter we, we, should, we should use for our training algorithm. But when we actually do this deployment on edge devices, we, we, can, act, we can profile and find out that, you know, uh, if you do this kind of uh, local training with 10 epochs, then it results in a massive increase in the energy consumption. Uh, it goes from 50 kilojoule to almost 100 kilojoule, and there's a massive increase in convergence time. And if if we can sort of trade off between, if we can trade off some accuracy, uh, maybe have like, let's say 3% less accuracy, 
uh, we can gain significantly on convergence time and energy consumption. And this kind of profiling is only possible when you deploy these things on edge devices, in this case, using Flower. But you know, we cannot have them using simulated for loops, for example. Uh, we, did, we did similar experiment with Android smartphones. In this case, the hyperparameter we changed was the number of clients selected in each round of federated learning. And we see a similar behavior that, you know, if you choose maybe 10 clients, then you get almost 0.87 accuracy. Uh, but it comes at a, a cost of a additional energy consumption. If you are okay with sacrificing some accuracy, you can choose less number of clients in, a, in each round of federated learning and you can save significantly on the energy consumption. Uh, another interesting aspect that we uh, evaluated was the computational heterogeneity of federated learning. So uh, we know that of course, if you train a model on a GPU, it trains much faster than a CPU. Uh, but again, using Flower by deploying these things, we could actually quantify this, uh, this uh, how, how long does it take on a CPU? So for example, to train a CIFAR 10 model on uh, using a ResNet, it is, uh, to train a ResNet 18 model on a CIFAR 10 dataset, uh, it takes about 80 minutes on a embedded GPU with on the NVIDIA TX2. And uh, when we actually deploy the same model on the CPU, it takes almost 1.27 uh, times more. Uh, and you know, having this kind of quantification helps us to see uh, what's the what's the increase in training time. And uh, one one potential way to reduce this training time is actually by assigning some kind of processor specific cutoffs. What it means is that you can sp uh, specify a cutoff for the CPU that you know after say X minutes. Uh, the CPU should send me all the results irrespective of whether the training is complete or not. And again, using Flower, we can uh, sort of measure these kind of cutoffs very specifically de depending on each processor. And in this case, maybe by specifying, let's say a 2.23 minute cutoff on the, on the CPU, we can significantly reduce the training time by losing, let's say only 0.1% in the accuracy. So again, uh, sort of quantifying these things help us to speed of convergence at the expense of some accuracy loss. Uh, and depending on our application, we can choose one way or the other. Uh, so just to conclude my talk, I would like to uh, highlight that uh, while it's always possible to you know, train federated learning algorithms and evaluate their accuracy in simulated environments, uh, it is very important to actually deploy and profile them on real devices. And it's uh, it's a key factor in designing real-world predictive learning systems. And uh, in our experience, flow, frameworks like Flower make it very easy to repurpose this existing edge-based training pipelines for predictive learning. And as I showed in the results, we can use these kind of quantifications for both hyperparameter selection, as well as to de design new kind of predictive training strategies, for example, by specifying processor-specific cutoffs, et cetera. So with that, I think I'm done and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Aki. That was a great talk. Um, there's one question. Uh, how difficult did you find, uh, find it to implement your own Flower client? I, I think you were, you were basically the first one who actually implemented the uh, Android client for Flower. So that was a challenge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think uh, it, uh, I think the, the real challenge uh, in the beginning was just to understand a bit more about how gRPC uh, protocols are compiled for Android, for Java SDKs. And I think that was probably the only complicated part to understand how to, uh, because, because these Android clients have to communicate with the Python server and we have to handle the, how the serialization of the weights and the deserialization of the weights work between client and the server. And that sort of required some understanding of how gRPC works on both Python and Java. So I think that part was probably the most complicated in some sense. Other than that, I think implementing the three core functions that we have in Flower, that was uh, pretty straightforward, I would say. And uh, just to add, like uh, when it comes to embedded devices, uh, Flower already has like Python-based clients available. So in that case, we, we did not have to change anything. We could just use existing clients uh, re potentially written for server-based environments and repurpose them for edge devices, but only for Android uh, Java-based clients, we had to change some implementation. Thank you. Um, 
Next question. Any thoughts on how much data would be needed uh, on device for convergence? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, so I think that there are like several aspects to it. One is uh, today, I think there is a common assumption made in federated learning that uh, all, the all the data on the device is labeled. And you know that's a very, very strong assumption to make. So I think the first challenge is really how do you label this massive amount of data on the device? Uh, and then I think the second part, how much data do you need for convergence is really dependent on the data set and how complex is the uh, neural network architecture we are using. So, and we have seen that, you know, the accuracies that we get with federated learning were uh, reasonably or somewhat, somewhat less than uh, centralized learning for many of the data sets. Uh, so there is always this accuracy gap for several data sets and uh, potentially by using uh, maybe better averaging algorithms or more data, we can bridge the gap. But you know the exact answer really depends on the architecture we are using and the data set. Makes sense. Um, so let's take another question before we go into the uh, go to the next talk, um, as we are slightly over time. Um, there is a question which says, "I was wondering whether you ferreted the whole model or just the last layers of the model in your work, given you are working with TF light fine tuning." Yeah, that's a very good question. So for Android, we actually federated only the last few layers because the way TF Lite works is, uh, as, I, as I described, you have to give a pre-trained feature extractor as the base model. So that has all the uh, heavy convolution layers inside it. And then we, we federate the training of the last few fully connected layers only. Um, I mean, one idea is that uh, I, I need to look more into the details, but potentially you, you can make that head model as simple as possible. Uh, uh, maybe like let's say one or two convolution layers and make the, uh, the head model a bit more complex. So, you know, in that sense, you can train a lot more on the federated side of things, but I think that may require some implementation, uh, some implementation uh, on the TF light aspect. We were just using the sort of uh, available libraries provided by TF Lite, which were which were primarily designed for training fully connected layers. But in principle, you can always train like uh, any kind of neural network uh, on TF Lite as well. Thank you. I think there was another question, but maybe you can uh, also answer it on the chat uh, directly. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll do that. Cool. Thanks. So um, maybe you come. We can go to the next talk. And again, th thanks a lot for your talk. And I also like the fact that you pointed out the importance of energy consumption. I think that should be more, yeah, more thought about.